everybody. Welcome back to the SIP series on the STIR. I'm your host, Trish Moiko Tobin, and we are back for another week of bringing you our take on the world of entertainment from the silver screen to the TV screen to the pages of our favorite novels. Speaking of which, joining me as always is our guest co host, entertainment columnist, sitcom creator, and producer, and now newly minted author. Debbie Baldwin. Hello, Debbie. Hi, Trish. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining us as always. So I suppose um, there's been plenty of excitement in the Baldwin household of late. Miss Baldwin's first ever novel is now available to the world. Congratulations, Debbie. Thank you. I'm so excited. And I just got mine this week and I cannot wait to dive into it. You know, so as for as long as I've known Debbie, she's always been in search of the perfect beach read and over the years she's recommended quite a few to me and that have been really really good ones but as avid readers Deb you and I know that sometimes we're in the mood for something and we can't quite find what we're looking for yeah and so in my case I one night I just decided to write what I was looking for and see you know how it went and it turned out pretty well and the initial response has been very positive so I'm so thrilled and happy to be, you know, releasing it. And um, the name of the novel is False Front. Yes. And it's um, go going to be part of a series. So the characters that are featured in this first book um, will appear again. So. Yeah, I understand you're already hard at work on that sequel. And I, rumor has it that we might be turning this into a movie. That's what I'm hearing from the rumor mill. What, what rumor mill? <laughs> I would very much like to be a part of that rumor mill. Rumor mill. <laughs> well, uh, you know, maybe if you think it, it'll happen. Right. <laughs> Put it out to the universe. But that is a, um, you know, that's sort of the powerball of wins for a writer. And it happens, you know, I don't know. But it's, we're, well, we're it's all cheering now. for you. We're all very excited. The novel is finally out. So this brings us to today's movie list topic, Debbie's top picks of film adaptations. So we're talking book to film adaptations, movies based on books. And Deb, I understand as much as 50% of all Hollywood films are based on some kind of literary work. Does that yeah. sound right to you? And it's particularly now where the big studios are putting their efforts into, you know, Avengers and big budget action movies, um, smaller independent film studios look at novels and their success um, with readers as sort of a bellwether for a film adaptation. So if you have written a best-selling novel, um, you know, like a Michael Lewis or a Stephen King, or, you know, any one of a number, it, you know, E.L. James with Fifty Shades of Grey. If you if you right. sell a million copies of your book, there will be independent film studios looking to adapt it to the screen um, because that way they have some measure of a guaranteed audience. So it's a smart move for film studios who are putting a lot, you know, taking a big risk, investing a lot of money in these films. And it's one way to know if the film is, you know, going to be successful. Sure, definitely makes a lot of sense. So for our list today, again, we've got Debbie's top 11. It's becoming a trademark for her. We are starting with a monster of a movie. And actually, I've been so happy to see that a couple of my favorite films of all time are on this list. But the very first film, we're going in chronological order once again, is from 1972, and it's a big one. It's The Godfather. Um, you know, I would argue that it's the greatest film ever made. It, Oscar certainly thought so. Um, it is adapted from Mario Puzo's uh, novel and is an incredible movie. Um, I can remember many sort of um, barroom basement trivia fights about The Godfather in college and one of them particularly was whether or not Robert De Niro is in The Godfather. And <laughs> he's not, he's not in the first Godfather movie. Correct. Uh, 
And, you know, but I saw a lot of people lose a bet over that. Um, but it, you know, won best motion picture, best film. Um, Marlon Brando, who plays the iconic role. And, you know, Marlon Brando is, you know, this is not a highly disputed <laughs> statement, but I would argue is the greatest American actor you know, of all time. And this role to me is proof of that because you take this ruthless, you know, what everyone imagines as this incredibly powerful mafia Don and humanizes him so effectively. And I mean, there's a scene in this movie when uh, the character has been shot and he's in the hospital room and Al Pacino, who plays his son, comes to visit him and Marlon Brando cries and says that he had imagined so much more for his child. He imagined him being a congressman or a senator or a head of industry and not stepping into his footsteps in the mafia. And I mean, I'm just, I just like gave myself goosebumps. Like the, that performance to have this man who, that you know is ruthless and vicious and a criminal and everyone is collectively weeping <laughs> over several points in that film because of his performance it's oh my god yeah he is definitely one of those actors and i'm with you i cry whenever he's on the screen just because his depth of, of like interpretation of any role he's like from on the waterfront to um streetcar named desire his intense vulnerability, like paired with this sort of tough exterior, is captivating. So on a bit of a lighter side, though, um, when it comes to The Godfather, The Godfather cast, do you know about all these mooning incidents on set? Please, please share that, though. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So apparently it was a huge thing when they were filming. It started with Robert Duvall and James Caan. And they would just moon, you know, cast and crew randomly. Even Al Pacino got in on it. If you recall that uh, scene of his when he was sitting behind a desk, and right before that scene was shot, he was working with the wardrobe people on the shirt to get it perfect. And he was getting impatient with the whole process when he just finally got up and mooned whomever was in that room. But the biggest moon of all involved uh, Mr. Brando. The wedding scene, the wedding scene. We oh my God! Four hundred cast and crew, and it was Don Corleone and his conciliar James Caan who mooned the full cast and crew um, during that wedding scene. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that. I would you know, love you kind of the footage of that. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, yes, it involved very serious subject matter. Um, so you probably needed some moments like this where, you know, yeah. you just kind of chill a little bit with the cast and crew. A little foxhole humor. Yes. But, you know, like you said, it's probably your most favorite film of all time. The American Film Institute agrees with you. It is listed as number three in the AFI's greatest films of all time. The quote that is listed as the number two of the American Film Institute's top movie quotes of all time, also comes from The Godfather. Can you guess what it is? Uh, it has to be, I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. There you go. That is number two in, in terms of greatest movie quotes of all time, second only to number one, which is, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> can't really argue with that yeah exactly exactly so from 1972 we're going to track on over a couple years later to 1974 probably one of the funniest films of all time which is young frankenstein or is it frankenstein <laughs> frankenstein I mean, it, the simple fact that it is marked as an adaptation, that the Academy considers it an adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, exactly. and it was nominated for Best Adaptation its year, is just adds, again, to the, like, the layer of comedy of this film and the genius of Mel Brooks. I mean, 
this is one of those, uh, you know, making a few notes about the films we chose and just reminding myself of actors or, you know, different crew members. Not, not for Young Frankenstein. I just <laughs> sat there and wrote them all down from memory. I could recite entire scenes of this oh movie. Oh, my goodness. Um, Marty Feldman, I mean, Gene Wilder, Cloris Leachman, the great Madeline Kahn, um, you know, who was a Peter Boyle as Franken, the, the monster. I mean, yeah. it just, it's everything, every scene in that movie, every line of dialogue. And I was kind of laughing because, you know, Mel Brooks, you can't, you couldn't make the movies he made in this day and age. I mean, they're so beyond politically incorrect. Exactly. That it's almost hard to even like describe some of the scenes. I mean, try and describe <laughs> Blazing Saddles to someone at a dinner party and see see how far you get. But um, I mean, just every moment of this movie is priceless. Gene Hackman in this hilarious cameo as the blind man that the monster encounters. <laughs> You're I mean, making me laugh just recalling some of those scenes. <laughs> I seriously, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have to go watch it after we finish. I know, exactly. That's what it made me want to do when I saw that list and, and this movie. So speaking of adaptations from book to film to song, do you know the song associated with this movie? I do not. All right. Aerosmith's Walk This Way. Okay. So that scene. Aerosmith was in the recording studio back in 74. They took a break, went to see the movie, and which reportedly inspired um, Steven Tyler to write Walk This Way from that one scene where Igor has, um, you know, Gene Wilder's walk character <laughs> say, walk this way, this way. <laughs> and that, that's the, the origins of the big Aerosmith hit Walk This Way. Oh my God, that's amazing trivia. I love and that scene. There's a, the next scene, you know, Marty Feldman plays the hunchback and in the next scene, his hump is on the other side of his back and she, Gene Wilder says to him, wasn't your hump on the other side? And he said, and Marty Feldman looks at him with a completely straight face and says, what hump? It, it, honestly that movie is gold just pure gold it's hilarious you know interestingly enough mel brooks considers this his finest film as writer and director though not his funniest i don't know it's pretty hard to um to top this but i'm sure there are some that that you can think of and i can think of but young frankenstein i mean it's just comedic gold <laughs> totally and it's, I mean, with, when you're Mel Brooks, you have a long list of favorite films to choose from. But um, yeah, this is definitely at the top for me. All right. So next on our list, I am so ashamed to admit, Debbie, I have not seen this movie, but it is from 1975. It's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with Jack Nicholson. Um, I'm, may, we may have to just stop recording. And I, I know. <laughs> We're going to have to stop every podcast because you yeah. come up with these movies um, that, you know, my gosh, yes. But it's on my list, of course. This um, was one of those Grand Slam Oscar movies. Um, there have been three or four. Um, it happened one night. The Silence of the Lambs was one that won the big sweep of the big awards, which is best film, best director, best screenplay, best actor, best actress plays a, a man convicted um, to a mental institution um, for a crime that he pled insanity to, to get out of going to jail and ends up in this mental institution with this wacky cast of characters and this evil, evil nurse, Nurse Ratchet. Which Even I know about Nurse Ratched because that's how um, much she has, you know, proliferated into the culture. I knew about her, but yeah, I have to see her in action. <laughs> and Louise Fletcher plays the role, and she has said in interviews many times that, I mean, how hideous to just play that part and have to endure, you know, 
I don't know, to have to like draw on that sort of dark, dark side of yourself to, you know, deliver that kind of incredible performance in the midst of these characters who are all very, so beautifully portrayed and, you know, have these meaningful roles. Um, the, the film is based on the novel by um, Ken Kesey. It won, you know, best, it won for its screenplay. Jack Nicholson, it's in my mind, his most brilliant performance. And he, again, has a long list to choose from to pick your favorite performance. But this one uh, has never been topped in my mind. It's the most incredible acting job I've ever watched on film. I mean, it's, it's an amazing movie and I really, really recommend you go see it. You go home and watch it right away. You have to see it. And you know, interestingly enough that you mentioned about the, how this may be one of the uh, top role for Jack uh, Nicholson, Kirk Douglas owned the rights to this movie, but by the time it was uh, going into production, he was deemed too old to star in it. He wanted to star in it, um, but he passed it over and um, Michael Douglas was one of the producers, his son, of course, was one of the producers of the movie, but imagine how that movie's trajectory may have changed or shifted if, if it was Kirk Douglas in the title role, in the leading role. It, that, it's an ama that's amazing. And, um, you know, Jack Nicholson also, interestingly enough, had so much confidence in the film that he took his salary as a percentage of box office instead of getting a paycheck which also worked out well for Great him. Great call for him. <laughs> to the tune of all, $100 million plus dollars. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, I think they all knew they had a winner on their hands with that one. <laughs> all right, so for our next movie, we're going to jump from the 70s straight into the 90s, Deb. I'm surprised you didn't have any 80s movies in here, but we have a lot of 90s movies, which also I found intriguing. And, you know, just in, the, in defense of the 80s, my favorite film decade, when you're trying to pick 10, it's, I mean, when I think of like that The Exorcist is not on this list or, you know, a dozen other films that just, you know, I'm, I'm sc scratching off because there's no room for them on the list. These are my 11, but there's it's so tough. many of them. Yeah. I know. All right. So we are jumping into 1991 with another one of those monster movies, The Silence of the Lambs. Don't go too close to the glass, Clarice. Um, <laughs> the Silence of the Lambs is one of those movies, you remember where you were when you saw it, you remember not being able to sleep. In a fetal position I, in the movie theater. I mean. Screaming and crying. That I can remember the second time I saw that film, I had just gotten out of law school and I was in Washington, D.C. with a good friend of mine and he hadn't seen it. So I was taking him to see it. And there were two gentlemen behind us in the theater speaking in full voice, uh, taking phone calls all during the previews. And my friend, John, said, I'm going to say something to those guys. And I just touched him on the leg and I said, you don't need to. The second this movie starts rolling, they will not <laughs> stay away. And it's that opening scene of Jodie Foster running through the woods in the FBI facility in Quantico. And sure enough, the whole scene theater goes quiet. It was, I mean, you that know, movie is incredible. attention grabber from scene one. Oh my goodness. So also this is one of those grand novel uh, by Thomas Harris who apparently was notoriously private and shy and declined every opportunity to be involved in the movie, except to say good luck to the cast and crew. So it was a real big surprise to the cast and crew when they won the Oscars, all those Oscars they won, and the author sent each of the main recipients a case of wine. That's awesome. <laughs> And uh, Thomas Harris, as, as you know, wrote, you know, Red Dragon and also wrote Hannibal. Um, and his knowledge of the material, you know, he deals with this concept of behavioral analysis um, uh, by the FBI, the BAU, which, you know, if you watch the, the TV show Criminal Minds, you know a bit about. 
um, you know, his premise that serial killers are not born, they are made, um, is prevalent in his novels. And what makes them so brilliant, and I do recommend reading them, I know that in film adaptations, it's, this is one of the things that makes them so difficult, difficult is you can't include every aspect of a novel in the film. But uh, Thomas Harris is one of those authors who I do suggest reading the books if you like the film because there's another level of fascination with his writing, which is this almost empathy for the killer that he develops very carefully um, and makes the books, they're just, you just can't put them down. The film, equally good. The acting, amazing. I mean, every character, and, and as we said, it, it's the, you know, one, the Oscar Grand Slam. Right, um, right. Anthony Hopkins, his performance as Hannibal Lecter is now iconic. Um, his little, I ate his liver with some fava yeah. beans. <laughs> I can make noise. You see the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> uh, Jodie Foster, both won the Academy Award. Um, Jonathan Demme, the director, and then it won for Best Film and Best Adaptation. It's a, And not only did it win fun. all the major Oscars, but it is on major list on the American Film Institute. Hannibal Lecter, the number one greatest movie villain of all time. And rightfully so. Yes, and Clarice Starling is ranked number six of all time movie heroes, the highest ranking female on the list. So that's pretty amazing for that one film. Every moment. Oh, and interestingly enough, an actor by the name of Ted, I think it's Levine, but it might be Levine, plays the role of Buffalo Bill, the serial uh killer. And you think to yourself as you're watching the film, like that role is like a career killer because you're never going to look at that guy and think of anything else, but it puts the lotion on its skin. And he did have a little renaissance in his career where he plays the police detective in the USA TV show Monk. Oh. And is um, Mr. Monk's, Tony Shalhoub's sort of best friend in um, the show, which did quite well in USA. And he yeah. does a great job with that character. So kudos to him after playing such a haunting disturbing role too. i know that's pretty great that's pretty yeah, great yeah. so from the silence of the lambs we go one year later into 1992 and we've got the player um starring one of my favorite actors tim robbins tim robbins and the player is um a robert altman film and it's arguably the least well known of um, the movies on this list. Um, it uh, stars Tim Robbins as a Hollywood player. And he, it's honestly, it is one of the most entertaining films. I put it on the list specifically because I thought, you know, it did not win an Academy Award. It was up against Silence of the Lambs. So that's why. <laughs> like all those films from that year, but sorry. Um, it was based on a book written by Michael Tolkien, who interesting, interestingly enough is the grandson of J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Oh, wow, okay. So, a little trivia. Um, in the film, Tim Robbins plays, I talk about like could not be farther from like what Lord of the Rings concepts, plays a Hollywood executive who's a mover and a shaker and, um, you know, crushes dreams on a daily basis. And he um, starts getting death threats from a writer whose screenplay he passed on. The problem is he passes on so many, he ha can't figure out- can't Remember who it is, yeah. Who it is. So as he is dealing with this complication in his life, he meets um, Greta Scacchi, Scotchy's character and um, who's a beautiful actress and they have start developing this romance but he is constantly looking over his shoulder because he's developed this stalker and so I, I cannot really articulate the genius of this film because what it is is it's 
the film, it's like a film within a film, uh, or yeah. the sort of constant satire about Hollywood. Hollywood satire, as it plays yes. out in true Hollywood fashion is, I guess, the best way to say it. Oh, it's, it's very cleverly written, and it was just very entertaining from start to finish. And, you know, again, Tim Robbins, this film just shows his versatility. It can show you that he can be a villain, a smooth talker, but as you'll also see later on our list, a very sympathetic figure. So, and he, um, yeah, and he's perfect as this, right, until, like, the tables are turned and he has to display some sort of, like, vulnerability uh, there's a scene in that movie that I can still remember where he's being hit, uh, nipped at the heels in his job by a new executive who's played by, I believe it's Peter Gallagher. Yes, Peter and, Gallagher, yeah. Um, they're in the car driving and Peter Gallagher says, uh, you know, oh, I, I met this, I hooked up with this studio executive at, at, at the, my AA meeting. And Tim Robbins looks at him and says, oh, are you, you're an AA, I didn't know you were an AA. And he says, he looks at him like he's crazy. He goes, that's where all the deals are being made. <laughs> and he's just attending AA meetings to like get in, to like make connections. It's, I mean, well, the, every line is dark and sarcastic and funny. And it's just a great, great movie. It really is. And, you know, seeing it on your list, I'm thinking I have to see this again because I really enjoyed yeah. seeing it the first time. Me too. So next on our list is another one of those movies that is just so unforgettable. It is Schindler's List from 1993, and it's based on a novel called, or a, a book called Schindler's Ark by Thomas Keneally, an Australian. Correct. It is a nonfiction novel um, about this true, you know, World War II hero, Oscar Schindler, who's played by Liam Neeson. Um, the film I mean, it, I'm speechless. Like that film is the Spielberg's crowning achievement. It's the most beautiful, rich, heartfelt love letter to the survivor. I mean, I'm choking myself up <clears throat> to the survivors of the Holocaust. That I mean, what a remarkable testament to that. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, speaking of Spielberg, to this day, all royalties and residuals that would have gone to Steven Spielberg instead go to the Show Foundation, um, which preserves testimonies from victims of genocide all over the world, including the Holocaust, because he thought that any kind of profit that he would gain from this film, uh, he considered it to be blood money. So um, that's an interesting tidbit about this film. It is... Um, considered to be Spielberg's greatest film by the AFI, and it is the American Film Institute's ninth greatest movie of all time. And interestingly enough, it won several Academy Awards. It did not win any acting awards, which was um, kind of a shame. Uh, Liam Neeson's performance is incredible. He lost out to Tom Hanks for Philadelphia in that trifecta window of Tom Hanks where he was basically no kidding yeah yeah um, those were his years yeah but um Ray Fiennes and Ben Kingsley all you know delivered incredibly stirring moving performances and the film is shot in black and white except for one scene which anyone who's seen the film knows exactly what I'm talking about it's unforgettable mm -hmm. and um yeah so Schindler's List is an exceptional film Okay, so I always find it fascinating, especially with a movie as well-crafted as this, to reimagine it with what could have been. Do you know who else was considered as Oscar Schindler? I do not. All right, so Harrison Ford was the first choice for the title role, but Mr. Ford declined because he thought that people would identify the most with the, the Indiana Jones character, and it wouldn't give this movie the seriousness that it deserves. So Mr. Ford actually declined. He was the first choice. Um, Warren Beatty, Mel Gibson, Stellan Skarsgård also were considered. Kevin Costner was very interested, very, very interested, even contacted Steven Spielberg to say he was interested and that he'd do it for free. <laughs> but 
of course, we know the rest of the story, but I just find it really interesting to see who else was, um, was clamoring for the role. And it's interesting too that Harrison Ford turned it down for selfless reasons, for the benefit of the film and not, you know, for his own reasons. That's it's remarkable, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So another backstory about this, which involves the author of Schindler's Art, um, Mr. Keneally, he was on his way home from the US um, from a book tour on his way home to Australia when on his way to the airport, he stopped by a Beverly Hills luggage store that was owned by Leopold Pfefferberg, one of the 1200 Jews saved by Oscar Schindler. So apparently there was a problem with his credit card at the store and it took about 50 minutes or so for his credit card to clear. So in that time, Mr. Pfefferberg convinced the author to go in the back room of his shop and show him um, his documents that were in two cabinets. Apparently, uh, Mr. Pfefferberg had been trying to convince producers and writers to go see his back room with all his documents. And it was Mr. Keneally who chose to make um, the story into his next book. He was the only one who bit. And um, I just found that really fascinating. It's just one of those things, right place at the yeah, right amazing. time, you know. Honestly, I love stories like that, like the universe. You think of the, you know, eight billion people in the world, and that man walked into that luggage shop. It's exactly, incredible. exactly. Yeah. That made me, you know, gave me the heebie-jeebies once yeah. again. <laughs> All right. So another one of those films that just make gives me all the feels every time I see it and I stop and everything what I'm doing that just to see this movie every single time it's on is The Shawshank Redemption from 1994, another Tim Robbins movie and Morgan Freeman movie. Now, and The Shawshank Redemption, um, it lost out, this was the Oscar year of Forrest Gump. And it's always interesting to me to see if you were sitting in your living room, you know, want, wanting to watch a movie one night and your choice was between Forrest Gump and The Shawshank Redemption, which film would you choose? I would see Shawshank Redemption. And I think that would be true for 75 of 100 people. I, I mean, it's for me such a memorable, genius film like that. You know, when I like, when I used to review movies, I would always hope for that what I used to refer to as that jackpot of a payoff at the end where you just feel the coins coming out of the slot machine and you're just like, yes, like you want to stand up. That's you're right. These are so rare. And this is the definition of that kind of movie for me. Um, it's based on a novella by Stephen King. It stars Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman as prisoners um, at the Shawshank Penitentiary um, where Tim Robbins deals with abusive guards and a corrupt warden. Um, and he is not, he has been, um, he was not guilty. Um, he has been incarcerated um, and was framed for a murder of his wife, I believe. And um, so as he is adapting to prison life, um, he becomes the accountant and sort of the Guy Friday of the corrupt warden. And that's how the story kind of plays out um, with this relationship between Tim Robbins' character and this warden and then his friendship with the old kind of lifer, Morgan Freeman, who is- Morgan you know, Freeman who plays Red. Who plays Red. And you cannot you know, underestimate that role um, of the you know, supporting actor in that film he is the definition of supporting actor for that role and that character in that film. Um, he is a genius. The performance is brilliant in its own right, but it never steals the spotlight from the main story. It's, uh, that film is brilliantly constructed and is so, every moment is interesting to watch. And again, as I said, the, the payoff at the end is a- Oh my a gosh. To your moments. Well, you know, Morgan Freeman has said that this is his favorite film that he's ever done. And I agree with Mr. Freeman, yeah. oh my gosh. 
and also his first ever movie in which he was narrating. Think of all those Morgan Freeman movies where he's narrating. He's like the voice of God. The Shawshank Redemption is his first ever movie in which he plays narrator. Um, also, I wanted to mention, you know, if you had read the book there by Stephen King, there are two major departures um, from the film. First is Morgan Freeman's character of Red, who was described as an Irishman with graying red hair. And so um, Eastwood, Ford, Newman, Red Ford were all considered to for the role of Red. Um, but Frank Darabont, the director, always had Morgan Freeman in mind and um, because of his presence and, of course, that voice. And cool. um, <laughs> one of Red's uh, lines in the book, maybe because I'm Irish, um, was kept in the movie as a joke. <laughs> yeah. oh, right. I just thought that was so interesting. And oh, that's my great. God, you know, good choice all around. I cannot picture this movie without Morgan Freeman. No, his role was iconic. He was great. An unforgettable performance. And so, you know, you're speaking about the Shawshank versus Forrest Gump um, comparison here. Tom Hanks was asked, actually considered um, for the role of Andy Dufresne, which was Tim Robbins' character. But he Not was filming amazing. Forrest Gump. But he was filming Forrest Gump. And um, he did, out, however, star in another movie that was also a, from a Stephen King book, which about prisons, which is The Green Mile, just right. a couple years later. That's interesting. Um, so who, guess who else was interested in the role of Andy Dufresne? Do tell. Kevin Costner. Man, he really wanted work in that. <laughs> but you know what? He couldn't do it. He was interested, but he couldn't do it logistically because he was working on Waterworld. Remember Waterworld? <laughs> well. Yes. Yes. So it's one of those things, time, you know, right? <laughs> things happen for a reason. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, Kevin Costner has made some incredible movies. Um, I question sometimes his range for roles that require a kind of an intense level of connecting on a, um, you know, I guess, we, I mentioned the word vulnerability several times today, but this is, again, is that kind of rule where you need to see that pain. And I I'm not- A little bit more depth to it. Yeah, I'm not, and I'm not sure that's Kevin Costner's strength as an actor. Yeah, now, I don't see him as Andy Dufresne. I definitely don't see him as Oscar Schindler. Right. And good for us movie fans, it didn't turn out to be that way. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, but anyway, we're gonna go from Shawshank Redemption to Apollo 13, one year later in 1995. Honestly, this film, I can remember seeing it. You're, you know, I'm at that age where I don't remember it, but old enough to, you know, kind of have my parents like tell me what it was like and that realistic fear of these astronauts. Um, it's based on the memoir by Jim Lovell, the astronaut, who also helped adapt the screenplay and who also is one of the characters. He's the character, uh, Tom Hanks plays him in the film. So he was instrumental in, in you know, making this movie happen. And it's an incredible film. The cast is unbelievable. Tom Hanks, Bill Paxton, Gary Sinise, um, Robert Duvall, Kevin Bacon, um, it just goes on, on and on. And um, oh, I'm sorry, I said Robert Duvall and I meant to say Ed Harris. Ed Harris. Uh, it begins, in fact, for Ed Harris, this long line of always the bridesmaid, never the bride, Oscar nominations for him. He's such a deserving actor. He's one of my favorites. I know he, everybody loves seeing him on screen. He makes the most of every role he plays. He is the mission control guy back down on the ground in Apollo 13. Uh, and he's nominated for Best Supporting Actor, uh, but does not win. Um, same again with him for several more right. roles that would come up in the next several years, including Pollock, which was an incredible performance on his part. 
um, which unfortunately he lost out to Russell Crowe in Gladiator, which is hard, you know, just a bad luck with the year on that. But, um, you know, Apollo 13 is the legendary story of the mission, um, the, the space mission and getting these astronauts back on earth safe and alive. And it's almost too much to take. You know what I mean? That movie is so, your heart is in your, your you hand. You definitely remembered how that movie made you feel because yeah. it was that kind of movie. And I just always remember the beautiful soundtrack that accompanied the movie. Um, it featured Annie Lennox, um, her vocals um, that score as well, which is so beautiful and, and complemented the movie really well. Yeah, that's great. All right, so we are moving on to the next decade, um, 2001's A Beautiful Mind, speaking of Russell Crowe. Um. A Beautiful Mind, speaking of Russell Crowe, right. And actually, this is an interesting story because that movie was on track to be another one of those Grand Slam films. It won uh, Best Picture, Best Screenplay, Best Director, and Best Actress, Jennifer Connelly. Um, Russell Crowe stars as the brilliant Nobel Prize winning economist, John Nash, who's a Princetonian. Um, and it tells the story of his battle with mental illness and his development of his pro Nobel Prize winning game theory. Um, however, Russell Crowe's performance is incredible, unforgettable. It was also the year Russell Crowe was uh, arrested. I know, I don't know if you remember this. It was, I do remember that. Uh, there was a lot of upheaval in his personal life and he attacked, um, I wanna say a concierge or a bellman at a hotel in New York City. And it was a huge, it came across the press, for, uh, you know, who knows what really happens in those situations. You think these people who are in the public eye get judged all the time without people knowing the facts of the situation. But the press reported it as this spoiled, rich, temperamental actor who's used to getting, you know, the m and the brown M&Ms picked out of the bowl for him having a tantrum. And I don't care what anybody says, this Oscar lose, he lost to Denzel Washington in training day, mm -hmm. um, was a direct result of his behavior and his behavior at the British Academy Awards, um, where he also had a little bit of a kind of an outburst. And I, point, you know, I, I knew of those incidents. I knew exactly when they happened, but I did not make that connection. And yeah. Denzel Washington won for training day. I kind of, hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, I love Denzel Washington, but I just don't think that that was his best actor movie. He was so many times. Absolutely no question. Yeah. And if you, I can still remember watching those Oscars and Russell Crowe, and again, it was another sort of exercise in arrogance, but he kind of chuckled and shook his head when he lost. Like, whatever. Like, you guys are, I get what's going on here. <laughs> like, and he was right. right. I mean, as arrogant as it was, it was, in my opinion, totally right accurate um but yeah so ron howard uh directed that film um another little interesting bit of trivia is uh paul bettany who plays the john nash character's best friend i guess you could call him in the film and i love paul bettany paul bettany and jennifer Connelly met on the set of that film and are still married today so that's a little love story that blossomed how uh, lovely, that's okay. great. Yes, yeah. I do remember that happening as well. So did you know that um, this is one of those rare films that was shot chronologically 90% of the time. You know, for the most part, when films are filmed, they're not chronological. It's whatever yeah. the, the logistics um, right. are best or whatever. But because, and mainly because they wanted Russell Crowe to, to help him develop, you know, that consistently progressive manner of behavior um, as with what happened with um, John Nash. So 90% of the film was shot chronologically. Which That's so interesting, you know, to, for a director to have that kind of deference for the acting process is 
very, I think it pays off in the long run with a film like that. Um, it's, you know, you, you think there's a, you're working with a budget and you're working with time constraints yeah. and you're working with difficult people. Um, artists, you know, are all difficult, whether they're behind the camera or in front of it. So that, that's interesting to me. That's right, that's right. So for, we have just a couple more movies left on our list. Next on the list is 2009's The Blind Side. Probably the most famous film for having an actor turn down a role that I can think of in recent times. And that is that Julia Roberts was originally offered the role that San Sandra Bullock took in this film and won her an Academy Award. So that's a little trivia. For the I was not film. aware of that. Oh right. my gosh. Um, but you know, these actors, I don't think they dwell on stuff like that too much. I mean, Julia Roberts has Julie her heart. <laughs> and, you know, you, you, you have a d complicated schedule and people that you want to work with when you're at that level. So few actors are, but you know, Julia Roberts and Sandra Bullock certainly can pick and choose their projects. But um, you know, this is the story of, um, you know, Sandra Bullock's character takes in uh, a homeless African-American boy um, to live with their family. Uh, it's the most incredible movie. It's based on the true story about the, um, now my, my NFL knowledge is going to be exposed, or lack thereof is going to be exposed, but Michael Orr, who last time I checked, played for the Baltimore Ravens, and I think he still plays football, but I'm not sure if it's for- Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> uh, I'm not even sure if the Ravens are Baltimore's team. That's how bad I am. Um, but anyway, it's a true story and they you know, take this boy in and he's, every scene in that movie is just so, it's one of the most heartwarming films based on the novel by um, Michael Lewis, who has written, my God, um, you know, the, the, the big short, um, Moneyball. He's had so many fantastic books, Liar's Poker. And, um, you know, several have been turned into incredible movies. He really has a knack for finding that nugget of just fascinating. It's both intellectually fascinating as this movie is, this kind of dynamic of brings in all of these elements of college recruiting and, you know, uh, play for pay and, you know, what's allowed and what's, what, what's cynical about the story and balancing it with this kind of wonderful, heartwarming reality of this family taking in this boy. And so, um, yeah, it's one of my favorite films. It's such a heartwarming story. And frankly, I was surprised that Tim McGraw was in it, you know, uh -huh. Tim McGraw, the country superstar, but he plays Sandra Bullock's husband and did really, really well. Yeah, um, he did do a fine job. I mean, it's, Sandra Bullock's movie from start to finish. There's, you don't need to really know any other actors in the film. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's all her and she deserves that Academy Award and it's a great performance. All right, so we are ending our list on a film from 2014. This was so just cleverly written. I enjoyed every minute of this movie, and this is The Imitation Game. It was the highest grossing independent film of 2014, then. It is. Um, in many ways, <clears throat> this film is a devastating film um, to watch. Uh, it's the story of Alan Turing, who's the British uh, mathematician who essentially invented the computer. Um, in his efforts to crack the Nazis Enigma code during World War II, which he does. I mean, he is a national hero in the UK, uh, really a global hero for his efforts during the war. Benedict Cumberbatch plays Alan Turing, who um, in uh, also the film also stars Keira Knightley. Um, it deals with Alan Turing's uh, sexual orientation, he's gay, and the film addresses that issue. Well, that's the true tragedy of the film. Um, you know, spoiler alert, it's his homosexuality is, becomes, he's uh, 
tortured over his sexual identity and it ultimately ends his life. Um, the film, however, deals more with this sort of cracking of the code and winning the war. And it's an inspirational story how he battles these, as you can imagine, the bureaucracy of war is as, as deep and hard to navigate as any corporation. And he has to kind of fight to get what he needs to get his job done, which he successfully does. And so it's a great story. So uh, did you happen to read the biography? Um, it, originally, the biography is called Alan Turing, The Enigma by Andrew Hodges, because it makes me wonder if they uh, delve more into that, um, you know, the, the, the inner angst of, of um, Alan Turing in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have not read it. Um, I think it would be a very interesting read, though, because as, you know, we've said before, and, you know, an hour and 20 and in, 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 in two hours, it's hard to kind of peel the onion on all the different components that go into the story. There's this very complicated um, relationship, you know, he has with Kira Knightley, who's basically his beard, um, his, you know, trying to have a personal life, a romantic life, his trying to solve the Enigma code, trying to navigate the military when he is not really a career military person, um, trying to get when he needs to get the job done and solve this unsolvable mystery. It's incredible. I mean, his genius is unparalleled. And I think Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch does an amazing job. Thank God he never changed his name for Hollywood. I mean. Oh, I know. And I love saying that name. And I love him. Every does. role he has played. He's such a chameleon of an actor. I just love him. It makes so, you feel smart to say it. You're like, oh, I just watched that film. Benedict Cumberbatch was amazing. Like, I just <laughs> sat there, you know what you're talking about. You know about. that Benedict Cumberbatch was in that film? He was. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that is our list of our top 11 uh, book to film adaptations. Deb, I don't know about you, but I always prefer to read the book before seeing the film. It gives me a better understanding of the characters, the plot lines as we were talking about. So to end on a sweet note, today we are featuring the perfect companion to a good book. Preferably as the weather gets warmer under the shade with a light breeze out in the porch or the patio or your deck. Um, Deb, we are making my tried and true lemonade. It's such a treat. The best part, it's so simple to make. Lemons, sugar, water, that is all you need. And we have the recipe for you on gazellemagazine.com. And when you get to the homepage, it's going to be under cuisine. You just click on that and you will see all of the recipes we have featured on the Stir Sip series thus far. Um, we also have information on how you can get your hands on Debbie Baldwin's new book, False Front. You will find it as well on gazellemagazine.com. Deb, it's been a pleasure. Congratulations on the new book. Thank you. Thanks so much, Trish. It was great to be here with you. Oh, it's always fun to be with Debbie. And thank you all for joining us. We can't wait to see you again next week. Bye-bye.